Hi everybody and thank you for being here today. My name is Maria, but anyway she said that before. And I'm working as a data scientist at LB. And just in case you have never heard of LB, it's an insurance company which has a centralized data science team. So we work with all different of uh, business areas to improve the process of uh, decision making through the use of machine learning. So as you can imagine, we deal with all kinds of different problems. So sometimes we have to I don't know, detect if a claim is a fraud or not, or we have to price policies and so on. So the range of scenarios we have to face is so broad, and the consequences of making our own decision in, our own decision in, such, a, in such a situation is so unpredictable. And when I mean unpredictable, I mean very expensive for the company that not all the time, not all the time, uh, our main concern is model performance. Sometimes our main concern is how good are our predictions. And that's why I'm today here to introduce the, con the concept of uh, conformal predictor. So this is the outline of my presentation. I come from academia, you can see that with the outline. And uh, <laughs> so first I will start with a motivating example because always makes easier to understand things. Then I will formally introduce the idea of conformal predictor. And after that, in section three and four, I will explain step by step how you can obtain a conformal predictor for a classification and for a regression problem. Then I will show a couple of applications, a couple of problems we have been working on LB, LB and we have been using this uh, conformal prediction with a very positive result. Um, to end the presentation, I will just summarize the main ideas and conclusion. And before finishing, I add some kind of references for this topic because I think it's cool and maybe after the presentation someone is very interesting and wanna read a little bit more about that. So let's start. This is the idea. Imagine that our policyholder has an accident with the car. So after having the accident, he has to call call center and report the accident. Then our task is gonna be to decide whether the car was a total loss or not. So how do we do that? To do that, we usually we have a set of uh, historical observation. XI is just information available about the accident, like uh, age of the driver, model of the car, and so on, and so on. And YI is just a label, yes or no, for a total loss. On top of that, we are gonna free to we are gonna be free to use any kind of machine learning algorithm, trick for the data, whatever we want to build our model. When our model is uh, built, we test it and retest it again, and we are really confident that the model performance is amazing. And then we are ready to go. We go live, and this is what happened: an accident happens, and then we run our model, and the model said that this is a total loss. So the client handler is there looking at total loss and thinking, mm, is this true? So we think, let's give him more information. So we give him the probability of being a total loss and we tell him it's 0 0.85, so almost total loss. But we cannot really believe that because how we compute this thing. Sometimes even it's not well calibrated the probability that the classifier gives us. So as we really believe in machine learning, then we think, okay, if everything that we did with past data is, gonna, is, is going to happen with the prediction, so if our model was like a 90% accuracy in training, tests, and validation, it's gonna be 90% accurate in the prediction. So we can even tell him, is your answer is 91% accurate. Okay, it's good. And on top of that, we can even tell him, and we will give you a 0.88 rock AUC of the answer. Anyway, the claim handler will say, okay, fine, but he doesn't know what to do with this measure. So he wants something that makes him feel confident about the decision. And there is a way to do it, and it's using conformal interval. Um, you will be asking why I pick conformal intervals or conformal prediction when there's plenty of there of method that can give you some kind of pred uh, prediction, uh, sorry, confidence about your predictions. I don't know, you can go for resampling method like bootstrapping, you can just assume that the target is uh, normal distributed and you just keep going with the standard theory. But what happened with this method? They all have something in common. You have either to make an assumption about the algorithm or about the data. However, if you use conformal prediction, you basically have 
to assume nothing or very little. Just this strange word that I cannot pronounce in English, but I can say <laughs> that <laughs> mean that the order of your uh, input doesn't matter. Okay? So it's nothing what you have to assume. Uh, on top of that, there is another thing that is uh, good. Um, you can use a conformal predictor with any kind of machine learning algorithm, so it gives you a lot of freedom. It gives you an error bound at the confidence level that you set before starting, that is also freedom and kind of confidence, but this is what we are looking for. The probabilities are well calibrated, so when we say 0.85, it's really 0.85, so it helps a lot. It's very easy to implement, at least this basic idea, this basic definition that I'm going to present here. And uh, as I'm a mathematician, I also like a lot the idea that this is really proven, and you can check this book where you will find all the proof, and you will see that I'm online. So <laughs> now that I more or less have convinced you that it's a good idea, the choice of conformal predictions, I'm going to try to introduce the idea behind the concept, OK? So now forget about um, prediction, machine learning, model, and everything. Just yeah? focus on the intuition. Let's assume that we have just a probability distribution and we don't make any assumption, uh, any assumption about that. And on top of this probability distribution, we have to define a function that is going to measure something about the sample of the distribution. But um, just to give you a clue, we are going to measure how weird is the new sample because we, this is what we are looking for. We are trying to find something that we cannot trust. So we have the function, we have the probability distribution, and then we draw five samples. I know it's not enough, but it's just a toy example. So we draw this sample, we score this sample using the function we have previously defined. And uh, if we assume that alpha 1 is uh, smaller than alpha 2 and so on, and you use a little bit of our imagination and assume that they are equally distant, blah, 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 we can estimate the cumulative distribution function of this thing, of this uh, score. And uh, if we draw a new sample for, uh, from the distribution, and we assume that the order doesn't matter, because I cannot say that, then we can easily say that the probability of this new sample being smaller than, for example, alpha 4 is going to be 0 0.6. It's quite easy to see. So that's the idea behind the method. You score your uh, predictions, you try to find what is the weird one, and then you can see if the new one is top of the weird thing or bottom of the weirdness. So let's try now to connect this idea with uh, our real problem. So if we try to connect it, the thing is like uh, the probability distribution is going to be our historical data set. X is going to be, as usual, information we have about the problem, and Y i just uh, the target we want to predict. Then we define this function. For example, for this example, I have defined the function of the absolute error of a regression model. Here I have to say something, because if you see, I have saved some, 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 uh, uh, sorry, some sample from the data set to uh, score the function. At this point, I have to say, there is two ways to go with this method. Either you retrain your model all the time, or you split your data set in a set for proper validation and for proper training the model, and another set just to calibrate this scoring function. As uh, we have to go live with the model, I think it's more efficient to go for with the second one because we cannot allow, I mean, it's really difficult to retrain the model all the time, plus it's really computationally very expensive. So I will all the time keep this uh, method, but the, the other is also possible. The thing is, we save them five, uh, we left out five samples, we score the function in this uh, five sample that we left out, and we get this time like 0 0.10, 0 0.13, this time we are able to get the numbers because uh, we know the, tr the true solution, and we also know that uh, we have a regression model that we have already trained with our data. And then again, we use a little bit our imagination and estimate the cumulative distribution function, and then we draw a new sample, and we score the sample, and we have absolute value of the true prediction of the true answer of the minus two, that is the prediction of our model. And this time we can really get the probability because we know 
based on the cumulative distribution function of these scores that the probability of this uh, prediction is going to be, for example, a small or equal than 0 0.3 at a probability of 0 0.6. If we use the, the, nah, the properties of the absolute value, it's going to really easy get that uh, the true solution is going to be in between 1.6, 1.7 and 2.3 with probability 0 0.6. So it's easy to get a confidence interval and it's not very complicated. So to formalize exactly this concept, what do we need if we want to get uh, the confidence of, if we want to compute uh, a conformal predictor for our problem? So as an input, what do we need? Just a set of training example. And the only thing that this example have to, uh, have to fit this assumption that the order of the observation is irrelevant. That's it. We are done with assumptions, so it's really free to go. Then you have to define a non-conformity function that is the official name, let's say, of the function f. This function, as I said before, is measuring how weird is your example. So if you use a little bit your logic before defining, it should be something that gives lower scores to something that is similar to your example and something very high to something that is not even close to what you want to do. Common choice for this function usually is some kind of function of the underlying model, but it can be anything. It's just uh, you have to be creative and come up with a cool idea, and then probably it will work super. And uh, you can use also the probability of your, uh, of your classifier for the correct class. You can use the distance to the neighbors. You can, I don't know, use the number of trees after your uh, classification that say that is yes, and the number of trees that they are saying is no. I mean, it's just be creative a little bit, and more than creative is try to understand what is going on in your problem, and then you will know just with intuition what kind of uh, function you have to define. Then you set a significant level, this is the easiest part, I think, you pick a number between zero and one, and that's it. Um, uh, then the only thing you have to do is see how these things work. So as I said, we divide the set of historical observation in two sets, one that we will use for training and another one that we will use for calibration. We built uh, our model using the test, the example that we have saved for training. Then we apply the function, the non-conformity function. When we have applied the non-conformity function, we try to estimate the probability distribution of these uh, scores. And then the only thing we, that is left is to decide whether the new example will be rejected or not. To do that, I mean, it sounds very complicated there maybe because I added a lot of formulas, but the idea is quite simple. We only have to compute this uh, p-value, and if you read the formula, the only, need, the only thing you need to know is the amount of time that in your probability distribution your score is larger than the actual score. I mean, it's like a percentage of time that this thing is going to happen. And then you have to decide whether this will be in your final interval or not, and it's really easy to decide. If it is uh, larger than epsilon, it is. If it is not larger than epsilon, it's not going to be. What do you get after uh, doing this? You get something called uh, prediction region, and that uh, you can prove that it will contain the truth with probability one minus epsilon. If you are solving a classification problem, uh, you will get a set of labels. This set of labels can be empty. If it is empty, then you will always uh, make the wrong answer, so don't trust your classifier then. If it is a hassle class, it should be always true, Always, if the answer that you have inside is true, of course, and if you have more than one, you will always uh, be right. On the other hand, if you are solving a regression problem, uh, as a result, you will have an interval, a real interval, that is going to contain the true answer with probability 1 minus epsilon. So this is the general idea. And now I'm going to add just like a little recipe for classification and regression, step by step, just in case you want to implement it or, I don't know, use it. And uh, the thing is, like, you start with uh, your, this is going to be fast, you start with your set of historical data, you assume that the order doesn't matter, 
as usual, you split the, the, the data in two sets, calibration and training set, you use the, the training for, uh, to build the classifier, you define the non-conformity function, you have to come up with a good idea to measure how we are your samples, then you apply this uh, function to all the, all the points that you have in the calibration set, and you set a significant level. This is basically the same thing for regression and for classification, and this is what is changed. So here is classification, then what you have to do is uh, for a new sample, you take all the labels in your label, uh, in your set of labels, and you compute the score for every label. When you have the score for every label, the only thing you have to do is compute the p-value for every label, for every score of every label. That is just counting the number of times that in your calibration set there is a, an example with a score larger than your score. And uh, once you have done this for every label, you just decide whether this label will be in your region or not, just checking if the p-value is larger than the epsilon you set or not. So easy not very complicated. For regression, you have to do exactly the same thing. Until step five is exactly the same thing, but the only difference is that instead of fit a calibra uh, classifier, you have to fit a regression model. The difference is here. So when you set the epsilon and everything is ready to go, the only thing you have to do is you order all the alphas and now you don't have access to all the possible solutions because uh, the target is a continuous uh, target. So what you do is you compute the index of the possible uh, score that will be associated to your, uh, uh, to your example. So the idea is quite simple. You will get the one minus epsilon percentile of the non-conformity score. You just get the percentile that you are set of the probability distribution of the score, the one that you built before. Um, finally, when you get this alpha S, plus minus the prediction is exactly what is your uh, uh, conformal predictor. Um, uh, now, I think that uh, everybody's ready to compute this thing. I'm going <laughs> to share a couple of examples that they are real application that uh, of a few problems that we have at, at LB. So the first one is a classification problem and it's exactly the same problem that we were talking at the beginning. We have to find out whether a car is a total loss or not. The data set, the data set was really in balance, what was a problem. We use XGBoost as a classifier and the model had a very good performance, accuracy 0 0.91, test 0 0.87, validation 88 and ROC AUC 88. Not really a big difference between train test and validation. We can say that there is no basically overfitting. We were quite okay. A new accident happened. So again, the same question. Are we confident or not? I have to say also that this problem, we have a restriction is that we have to minimize the number of false positive because false positive is unpredictable for the company. So it's expensive, as I said at the beginning. So this is what we try. Then we try to minimize this number of uh, false positives e positive using conformal predictions. The only trick uh, thing was how to define the non-conformity function, and this is what I did. I defined the non-conformity function for this uh, problem as uh, the average between the probability for every, class, uh, for every class of my classifier plus a recalibrated probability of the same class. How I recalibrated the probability? I did it by penalizing being total loss, and I didn't do any, fa any fancy thing. A psychic learned it everything for me, and you have here the code, it's really easy to reproduce. So this was the, um, uh, with this, I build my scores, and then I had to compute for a new case what was uh, my uh, predicted, predict, predicted region? Okay, sorry. And uh, just to make it simple, I will show the real result later on, but just to make it si simple, let's assume that in our calibration set, we only had nine examples, okay? So as I said before, we have to compute the p-value per, per label and per new accident. And we have first all the values per uh, all the scores per label. In our case, we have two labels. One is total loss, the other one is non-total loss. 
and this 0 0.87, 0 0.99, this is the average of the probabilities of the one that is not calibrated plus the one that is cal calibrated divided by two. Then I did exactly the same thing. I scored the prediction of my model, that is total loss. So for, for the total loss, I got 0 0.85, and for non-total loss, I got 0 0.15. Then I go to my distribution of uh, scoring, and I just count just the percentage. I have 0 0.85, I just count is 1, 2, 3 plus 8 are smaller than 0 0.85. So my p-value is 8 divided by m plus 1. 0.8. I check if it is m larger than the epsilon I set, that is 0 0.05. Yes, it is. So it will be in my predict in my I'm sorry, predict whatever in the rate set of uh, predictions. And the same for non-total loss. I compute the score. I go to my set of labels. I check how many of them are uh, smaller than larger than than the one I have. And then I just divide by the total num number by one. I get a probability. I check if that probability is larger or smaller than the confidence level that I set at the beginning. And if it is uh, larger, I put it in my set. So I get at the end a set that contains the true solution with 0 0.95 uh, probability. What I, okay. Before uh, saying how we use this thing, I, this is not exactly the real, uh, this is how you can implement this method, it's not exactly the real implementation, but LB doesn't allow us to release everything that we do there, so I just fake something, but can give you an idea of how to do it. The only thing you have to do is define p-values for every, you can even bet, do it more optimize this thing, but just to give you an idea, you, have def you define a p-value, for every of the label that you have, and you just count the number of times that your uh, score is going to be smaller than the score that, than the other score, you sum up and you divide by the number of uh, elements that you have in the set, the same for all of them, and then you check whether it is larger or not than the epsilon, and then you put it in the set. In our case, that we use this conformal interval to get rid of false positive was really handy. These are more or less the real number, but not the real number, because LB doesn't allow us to say, <laughs> hey, this is what is happening. But anyway, we have a validation set that the let's say it was half a million, roughly, and uh, 50,000 total losses. And uh, in, this, uh, in this first row, you can see that without any conformal interval, the number of false positive was almost 10,000. Then we use this uh, conformal <coughs> interval, we set an epsilon of 0 0.05, we recalibrate the probability, as I said, the average of both probabilities, and then we can see that we get, with two classes, 67% of the false positive. So every time we got two classes, we were not sure that it was a total loss, and we stopped classifying those as a total loss. As a result of all of this, we decrease the error of of false positive in a 67%. So it was a lot of saving. We save a lot of money because unpredictable is, as I said, very expensive. Uh, I also add another uh, application that is a, classif is a regression problem. This doesn't look so great, but anyway, I will try to, to show you how to compute this thing. And uh, this is a real problem somehow. We have to find out the price of the car. Um, uh, the problem was that the data set was not correctly labeled, so that was quite noisy. We used a light GBM to predict this thing. The model performance was quite okay. We get a 0 0.95 of, uh, in the error to score. The, the error is quite far from the mean, so we were really happy, and we thought that the model was predicting quite okay. So, with this, the typical checking that you do in insurance. You bin your, um, out your uh, target, um, per target you count the number of examples you have in this bin, and you compute the mean of the average, and on top of that you compute the mean of your prediction. You can see that uh, when you, we have a lot of observation, we have this uh, high yellow bar, the model is behaving quite okay, and when we don't almost have no observation, the model is doing something weird. But in general, we can see that the model have a quite uh, good performance. But what happens if you really plot what is happening 
point by point. It's really difficult to see. I mean, it's not that the true value is so ordered. It's that I order the true value, and on top of that, I plot the real prediction. If I do it the other way around, it looks very noisy, the true value. But the thing is, like, uh, it's really difficult to see anything there, but here I blow up just 15 points, and you can see how noisy the prediction is, even when we have such a good behavior in a model. For example, here you can see, like, sometimes maybe it's like, 50 pounds more or less, that is okay if you are not so accurate with the price, but uh, in the middle you see that the price is like uh, 1,200 and we are saying that it's basically 4,000, so we are really far from the solution. And this is not the, the worst example I could show you, I could even show you something worse. So what would we do? We try to compute the uh, conformal interval. How to compute conformal interval if you have a regression problem? So we did the same, we fit the same, we separate the, the test in label and blah, blah. So we define a non-conformity function. Our was uh, more fancy than this one, but this one is just for this example. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I took the simple one. And I define the non-conformity function of the absolute error between the prediction and the truth. Um, we assume again that we only have uh, nine examples in our uh, calibration test, uh, calibration set. We order all of them in the descending order, as you can see. These are all the score for the point for the points that I have in the calibration set. And now, as I said before, we have to compute the zero point multiplied by ten. It's like the second percentile of the distribution, and this is what we do. And it's just, you get the index, you compute the percentile, and you compute the percentile. I mean, there is nothing fancy about computing a percentile. Everybody knows how to do that. How to do that. So then you take this alpha, and this, al this uh, deprediction of your model, plus this percentile that you set with the epsilon at the beginning, is going to be your, uh, pre your conformal interval. You can see here that uh, don't look at the other one because it's super noisy, the data set, and it's really difficult to see anything, but in this small one, you can see that uh, the blue one is the true value, and you can see how this interval contains the true value basically at 95% of uh, the time, so the method is working quite okay. Um, uh, that's it. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I'm going to be brief. I just want you to keep in mind a few ideas. The first one is like, uh, good model performance does not always mean trustable prediction. I think I have convinced you with the plot. Um, of course, it depends on uh, your goal. If you want to win a Kaggle competition, probably an amazing rock you see is, uh, is enough. But if you are going to make decision using the prediction of your model, I think you should be sure, or you should trust, trust somehow what you are predicting. So conformal predict, another good thing about, uh, another thing I want you to remember is that the conformal predictor is a useful tool and it's not only about getting conformal interval, it's also, it can be also used for different application. It helped me a lot to reduce the number of false positive. Um, it doesn't assume a lot, of a, a lot of things, so it's cool because we can use it all the time. It's easy to understand, I mean, see, 20 minutes and everybody now understands what it is. It's really easy to implement as well. Um, it's not very computationally expensive, at least it's not very computationally expensive. This basic definition that I presented today, it can be more computationally expensive if you use another technique. Um, it can guarantee a confidence level of 0 0.99, so it's telling you that you will make an error of only 1%, so say, you can trust what you are predicting, and uh, on the other hand, on the negative hand, you have to, it's a little bit problem dependent because uh, you have to define your own non-conformity function, and it's not always easy. You really have to understand what is going on with the error of your, of your model to be able to define something that is going to be really helpful. And that's it. Before finishing, I just want to say that there is a lot going on out there about conformal prediction. It's plenty of paper, books, and readings. And if someone is interested in the topic after this, this presentation, I will say just go and check because it's quite a nice thing. And that's it. So just to make sure I got the intuition right, we've got some uh, conformity function that 
which kind of tells you uh, where your point is in the space. And you might fit in a sparse part of the space, and you want to be less confident, this kind of thing, right? Um, so, so what about like uncertainty because of like maybe you don't have the right features? So for example, if you could imagine that like you don't have all the features that you need, maybe there's some others which would mean that actually your, your, your data space was a lot more sparse than you thought it would be. How do you handle those kind of uncertainties? Like those models as well, which you so you are space. asking me that if I don't have all the features, how handle how I handle the uncertainty in that case? Exactly. Oh, then I wouldn't use uh, conformal <laughs> prediction because I'm assuming that I have enough information to believe the error of to believe that the error of my model is giving me extra Just information. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Um, uh, the next question is, um, how does this compare to, to basic methods, for example? Um, you can use basic methods. I said that at the beginning. The only good thing about that I can see about this thing is like uh, you don't have to make any assumption. I've been a mathematician all my life. I don't really like uh, starting with, uh, okay, it's normal, but you can see that it's not normal. Or I assume that this is going to happen, and it's really true that it's not going to happen. So that's why I give it a try to this method. But this may be a personal, uh, a personal choice. I mean, I don't I'm, not, know. Not, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting it's bad or good. I'm just, no, no. I'm just, I'm just asking. In the sense that at least you can believe what you are getting, I like it a lot. Maybe you can get more accurate results with another method, but it's always tricky if you don't really fit all the assumptions. So that's what I think. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm curious about this uh, average uh, prediction and uh, calibration probability model. Why then we use directly that calibration probability? Is there any intuition in there? Sorry? Recalibrated. Recalibrated probability. Yeah. yeah, so I was curious about why you are averaging and not using directly the calibrated probability. Um, because uh, my model, the performance of my model was quite okay. And my goal in that time was only to reduce the number of false positives. And I came up with the idea of penalize the false positive by recalibrating with this sample weight. Yeah. That's why you are not using just the calibrated probability and you are averaging with your with the because input I didn't want to lose the information that my classifier was giving me because the behavior was quite okay. I just wanted to penalize the probability of the classifier. As I, can, I was happy with the classifier. I just wanted to penalize it in some cases, especially in the false positive. That's why. I mean, it's not really. I was maybe another personal choice. I mean, yeah. it's like. A, <coughs> If you just take the calibrated per probability, you will have the same problem. Maybe your accuracy or your model performance can decrease. But the moment you average both, you just I, I realized that I was just penalizing these false positives, and I was keeping the accuracy at the same time that I was penalizing the false positives. That's why I use it. But of course, my goal here was clear, was reduce the number of false positives. Maybe in another uh, content, you need to do something else. This, I don't know. Very interesting presentation. Similar question to what you just asked. So in your regression problem, it uses non-conformity, basically the absolute distance between the prediction and the ground truth. I would have expected in the classification problem that you would have used something like the cross entropy or some other loss function with respect to the ground truth of the classification, while the ground truth of the classification is not at all in the non-conformity function. So how does that work? <laughs> And you will say the so the ground truth in the classification non-conformity <coughs> function does not appear, so to speak. You just have the predictions and you average them. Yes, uh, average them. So, sorry. Let's say it again. In the regression problem, yes. you are doing the absolute distance between the truth and the prediction, right? So, in a certain sense, you're saying I score the errors and I only trust the ones where I know that the error is not too great, and that's fine. Okay. But in the classification one, the ground truth is not in the non-conformity function, so I don't understand how that makes you confident of the predictions. Uh, if you are asking me why I use this uh, conform non-conformity function for the regression problem, and you think it's very simple, that's your question? No, my question is why is not the obvious one? Why is not the loss function of the classification problem? Have you tried it, didn't work? The thing is, uh, I just picked this to show one example. It's not the final one. I mean, you are free to use anything you want as long as it's measuring what you want to measure. 
the non-conformity okay. function is something is free. I mean, you if you it's a very good idea by the way what you say. I might try <laughs> to use it. <laughs> it's not that uh, you have to use what I said. It's, uh, no, sure. I just wanted to understand yeah, the reasoning behind it. Was no reason for else. the classification problem. I just wanted to show an example that you can easily compute it, and it's uh, I don't know. I just picked this example. Maybe it wasn't the best one. Okay, I think we'll call it there. There's tea and coffee outside, but please let's thank Maria one more time.